Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. I'm not Will Sanchez, I'm Roger Robinson, the one-time host for this particular show, and my very special guest is Will Sanchez. A lot of you viewers and followers of the show asked if they could know more about this runner and community TV producer and many other things who, in his self-effacing interviewing style, has made such a success of this show over now 150 installments. So Will asked me, and he chose me, I think, because of my authentic New York accent, uh, if I would come in as uh, his replacement host for this occasion and ask him the question. So today it's not got to run with Will, it's got to talk with Will. Welcome, Will Sanchez. Thank you, Roger. Well, with this honor. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't want to vary from, from the format of the show that, that, that you have made so successful. So I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask about, you know, who is Will? What are your beginnings? Where were you born? Your family? Something you always ask rather disconcertingly, I find. Any siblings that you wrestled with? <laughs> uh, so, so tell us about the beginnings of Will. The beginnings. Well, I was born in New York. Uh, Women's Hospital in Upper West Side. My parents came here from Puerto Rico to find work and to raise a family. My mom was a, life, was a lifelong seamstress, and my dad was an entrepreneur, which is probably where I get it from. Uh -huh. He started as a baker in a company you may have heard of, Horn and Hard Art, uh -huh. now extinct. From there, he founded his own bodega. And so as a child, as one of the oldest, I got to carry food from home when my mom would prepare mm. to the store. Growing up was hard because uh, my parents were trying to make it. And, and being a seamstress at, uh, at a company, Maury Lee was next to Gimbel's at the time and she would work long hours, and she would make pieces of, of uh, wedding dresses. And this is all in Manhattan? My whole entire life is Manhattan-driven. And running a bodega is like a 24-hour job, yeah. and both of my parents never got beyond grade school. They had to drop out because back in Puerto Rico, they lived on farms, and they had to go and support the other siblings, their brothers and sisters, and feeding the chickens, whatever farm life was like. And what about you, Will? You went beyond elementary school. Yes. How, yes. how did that happen? Well, my, my parents were, were very, very smart in knowing that the kids needed to go to school. And so they instilled in me and my siblings the importance of an education, and they sacrificed everything to make sure that we were educated. That was their number one primary goal, was to provide for us. They never took vacations, for example, so I'm sad to say. So I went to elementary school in Manhattan. I remember the, the interview process, and my mom, you know, prepped me, they're going to ask you questions, and he says, you know, one of the questions is going to say, where do you live? And I said, okay, got the answer. Of course, when I went to the interview, the question was, what was your address? And I didn't know what that meant. But nevertheless, I passed and got to school. Well, you and I have some things in common, because we both came, though, of course, was brought up in the United Kingdom, came from very modest backgrounds, parents who never had higher education, and we both made it on scholarships. But I gather, I suspect there is one fundamental difference between us, which is that you have a secret passion that I absolutely cannot share, which is math. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think math has help to shape your life, isn't yes. that right? So oh, absolutely. So tell us about that particular skill. Uh, that skill came on early. I think I got it from both of my parents. My parents, again, they never began grade school, but my dad, he ran a, a bodega, which is a grocery store, and he had to keep the books. And I saw him at night with the paper and pen, you know, keeping score of his inventory, of payroll, and I was, uh, later on, I didn't realize it at the time, later on, I was amazed that he was so good with numbers. It turns out, particularly in high school, I blossomed in algebra. I immediately, when saw what the teacher was writing, I knew exactly what the answers were in geometry. I immediately knew. 
And it was, it was interesting because after a while, the teachers realized I knew more about math than they did, which was astounding to me. And so when it came time for me to pick uh, a college for, in high school, and I won a, a medal in mathematics in my junior year, and this was high school with 700 people, and I came in first in mathematics. Mm -hmm. I was very proud yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. So in my senior year, I decided I was either going to become a pharmacist because I realized that I always have work as a pharmacist. Again, my, my parents instilled in me to be practical. And, and I researched it and I found a program that had a six year thing. But for some reason, um, I went to City College. Oh, be, I know why, because it was free at the time. No tuition. And I discovered going to City College with the other kids from all over the, the city that I was no longer the number one student in mathematics. I could barely keep up because I was in advanced placement. I was always in advanced mathematics. I always had to catch up. But I, I, but I, I loved it. It was a challenge. And so I studied extremely hard in college. Didn't, that, didn't you go on eventually oh, to yes. doctoral level? Or? Yes, I yes. did. Yeah. I did. In college, I, I got better and better. And then I needed to decide, well, what I want to do after college. And my parents, again, encouraged me, you know, get as much education as you can now. And I said, okay. And I got a scholarship to several colleges. Purdue University wanted me very badly. They, when I turned them down, they came back with a counteroffer. Nice. <laughs> so I said, what? <laughs> I felt like a baseball star. Wow. They this me... wasn't a sporting scholarship. This is, this is a mathematics scholarship. Yes, yes yeah. a mathematics yeah. scholarship, yeah. counteroffer. They offered me more money, and they, and they said they agreed to pay my housing. But I was very shy and introverted at the time. I, I, was, I was fearful of leaving Manhattan. Mm. To my, my life was always Manhattan and Riverside Park. I never went beyond that. So the idea to go to Indiana scared the heck out of me. That's funny. I always say New, New York is a village. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but NYU, the Courant Institute that offered me a full scholarship, is considered one of the 10 most important mathematical institutions in the world. And so they had gods there to me, the mathematical gods. So mm. I said, well, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to go to NYU. And, that's, and that's, I went there for three or four years, got as far as getting my master's, got as far as passing my orals for PhD, which is a gruesome test where you have to stand in front of your professors. I've done and it. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> luckily, as uh, they told me, I could think on my feet. So I passed that. And then you needed to take some time to decide on your dissertation. <clears throat> so I decided to visit my friend who was teaching computer science, which was a relatively new art or new science at the time that I was growing up in the 70s. I was just going to ask about where this came contextually. So computers were just developing. You had this mathematics skill. So yes, yes. you found your natural marriage. Yes, yes. You started uh, helping the other students in the, in, the, in the labs. Even though I wasn't technically in the uh -huh. class, I was just sitting in because she just got her PhD from yeah. NYU and she was going to help me, you know, to figure out how to get to the next level. I, I fell in love with Fortran. I don't know they teach Fortran anymore. And, uh, and she said to me, you know, you can get a job doing this. I was astounded. What? I love doing this. They actually will pay you to do this? <laughs> And so I opened up the Sunday Times, and there was a position for a, a marketing job that required programming skills in BASIC, which I knew nothing of. So the night before the interview, I read up about BASIC, went to the interview, met with the marketing director. He asked me nothing about BASIC. He would ask me questions about marketing. So that became your career? Yes. And from there, it took off. But bef before we get into running directly, another part of your current life that I want to ask about is this show. This is Will, the community TV producer, which is what you are as, as, as well as the interviewer. And you've made this remarkable contribution to New York running by creating and sustaining this show. How did it begin and, and what were you trying to achieve with it? This show came to exist overnight. It was not a three-year plan or a five-year plan. At the time, I was, I still am, a member of the community board. It's a local organization that helps bring quality of life issues known to the, to the mayor and to the other electors, what the community is concerned about. And they had a show called Community Board 8 Speaks that I was involved in.
And that show was being done upstairs. This studio is much bigger, and upstairs they have smaller studios. And I always has studio envy when I look downstairs. Oh, I want to go down there. So I wanted to take my community board uh, show that I was technically producing downstairs. I was never in front of the camera for community uh -huh. board. I speak. I was the technician behind, making sure things were going fine behind the scenes. But I was frustrated that we had limitations. And this is all voluntary work, yes. isn't it? Just as, this is your contribution to the community. Just want yes. to get that, that straight. Y yes, yeah. the community board is voluntary work, and the work we're doing here is all voluntary. Yeah, right. But extremely important and valuable. Uh, I can't imagine doing anything else, what I'm doing now. And so I, I got trained to able to work these, these, these studios. And when I graduated, my instructor said to me, well, now you can do your own show. Later that night, when I was in bed, my eyes popped up, and I realized I can do a show about running. All right, so now let's bring those two streams of your life together. Uh, you, if you have the idea of making a show about running, you must by then have been a runner. Yes. You're not just a mathematician and marketer. No, no. So when did the running start? You probably remember the Y2K controversy where oh, yes. the planes were going to go to crashing down because of the turnover of the year to the year 2000, the double zero, because programmers, in, in the days before modern computing, storage space was at a premium. Instead of using a four-digit year, they used a two-digit year anyway. Uh, my company had merged. I was running a software house. And at the time, before the year 2000, I had merged with a bigger company. And we made a killing in supporting companies in the year 2000 support. So when the year 2000 was over, my company, my huge, my bigger company, decided to make a change of direction and made me an offer that I couldn't refuse to retire. Oh, because so they wanted to take it a different direction. You're a kind of beneficiary of that white year to. 2K, yes. whatever it was, Y2K, yes. and, and you notice confusion we survived and, nicely. and panic. Yes, I know the whole world was going to fall apart. Well, thanks to my company's you... contribution and others, it didn't. Ah, I keep I telling see. people. That's great. So you, so you made a good financial cut. So then you could choose what yes. to do with your life. Yes. Very nice. Yes. It's a real New York story. You know, poor immigrant boy comes through, gets scholarships, gets himself in that, in that situation. It's good. Yes, it's completely unplanned. Just because you made a lot of money doesn't mean to say you're going to become a runner. That's an interesting choice. <laughs> yes, yes. I needed to get exercise. So I went to the, my wife's gymnasium, and I started exercising. And I was gaining weight at the time. In fact, at that time, my waistline was approaching 38. And I said, no, this is not good. So, but the exercise wasn't doing enough. So I started running on the treadmill. And the first thing I did on the treadmill, I realized I was burning up. Oh my God, this is the way to get better shape mm -hmm. because this running is just totally burning me up. Then I got a postcard in the mail, team in training said, I can take you from a couch potato to a marathon runner in 18 weeks. So I went and signed up to team in training for the Vermont Marathon. This is the Leukemia and Lymphoma, lymphoma yes, yes. Charity they're, Foundation, they're, isn't it? They're they're the, they do a really great job, the purple outfits. For my wife never heard of them, and when I went home and told my wife I signed up for this, she was in total shock. Was she a runner at all? No, or? no, yeah. never. A quick story, my wife's uh, athletic achievements was this. When they picked sides on who to play on the on whatever team, she was never picked. <laughs> Oh, well. They started playing without her. She became a runner later. Yeah, I remember, and she was a very substantial woman yes, as well. Yes. Yeah. yes, she became a good runner. You were just getting into running, so team in training was crucial. And That's so right. now. That's... And the first run I did was, that was I remember, forget, was on a February Saturday morning. It was very, very cold. I had a cold. I had a sinus thing. I wrote to my coach, Ramon. Should I run today? I'm not feeling well. Of course, he was getting hundreds of miles. I never heard from him. I showed up. By the time we did the three miles, I felt wonderful, and I didn't have any, and my head was cleared up. So warm. From that, <laughs> from that moment on, I knew I was a runner. That's great. Was it the Vermont Marathon, did you say? The Vermont Marathon was the first one I did. Of course, people said, well, why didn't you do New York? Well, well for one thing, I couldn't get in. Yeah. <laughs> now I wasn't afraid to travel. In fact, when I was in my business environment, I traveled a lot. Oh, so you could leave Manhattan now? Yes. 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 I already <laughs> been, I already seen half the world by the time uh -huh. I, my running yeah. started. Yes. Uh, so I overcame my fear of leaving Manhattan at some point. Well, it's very interesting that, that 
you, the, from the very start, running for you was involved with a charity. Because something that really strikes me about this show, and I'm just going to read its, its, its mission statement. Uh, it's the mission statement of this particular show, Got to Run With Will, is to introduce personalities who have used the gift of running to transform their lives and to better the lives of others. And in running, we kind of take that for granted. But I thought, if you were putting on a television community TV show about golf, uh, or about horse racing, or about ocean yachting, or NASCAR racing, would you have a mission statement that the purpose was to interview people who've used this to better the lives of others? It seems very unlikely. What do you think is special about running, and, and how do you think this alters the culture that you and I and most of our viewers are part of? That's the way I always saw runners as, always contributing. I was just amazed by, well, I was introduced, as you said, with, with uh, team and training. So I got to hear, because of course in the long runs that we did, we, we got to talking, and they would share their stories. And because many of them were representing either family members that had cancer, or fighting cancer, or friends. I, I wasn't running for any particular person in my family that had cancer. But I was very moved by their stories. And, I, and that, of course, helped me to do the show that I eventually mm. got to do, because I kept hearing their stories. And people would tell me at the time that I said I was going to do this show, they told me, oh, you're a natural for it. I said, really? <laughs> because of the way I would interact with the runners and getting them to open up. And all I did, of course, was listen. And I had barely enough energy to be able to speak just to keep up the pace. <laughs> of course, we call it conversational pace we, we, purposely. And so, so that was my first introduction to runners as these people that were very caring. And this was, this was very, very hard for them. Many of them were never runners before like I was. They mm. were doing it because they were doing for a cause bigger for themselves. Oh, yes, and they totally loved what it did for their bodies. They got fitter, and they noticed they could be able to do things. They had freedom to do other things that they thought were inconceivable at the time. It's fascinating, that transformative quality. And then some of the causes that you, you've supported, one, one that I got interested in, is clearly important to you as it is to me, is the way that running as a culture is committed to conserving and improving the environment and also making it accessible for runners who are, who are non-damaging. You got very involved with the Putnam Trail. Tell yes. us about that one or about the environmental issue yes, in yes. general. But I had a runner here, Michael Oliva, and he told me the story of the Putnam Trail. That uh, it's, a, it's a one and a half mile trail in Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx. It used to be a, a railroad trail, hmm. a railroad tracks, help people from uh, from the Bronx get to Westchester. But the, it was abandoned almost 40 years ago, and, uh, and nature took over. You know, Mother Nature took over, and it became this beautiful trail that the community got to know. And, uh, and it, it's not a running trail per se, but it's a, because it's soft dirt, it was a great trail to do your cool down. Mm. So a lot of the runners would go there, oh, and run a mile and a half, what happened after a, mile and a half, after a mile and a half, you hit Westchester, which is paved. And there's no canopy there, you know, it's just this open space. They would run, okay, turn around, and, you know, and went back. And he was telling me that the Parks Department, in its infinite wisdom, wanted to pave this over. To oh, of course. <laughs> I, I once wrote, when I was first coming to America, 30 or 40 years ago now, I once wrote, it seems the ambition of this nation is to pave over the entire continent coast to coast. Because every trail that I run on, that I used to run on, you'd find it had been paved over. Oh, so you fought, you fought against that? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and he was telling me they were running into all sorts of obstacles. But then, as, you, as I mentioned, I'm a community board member, so I said, well, have you gone to the community board? They, he said they have, and they supported it or something. Well, the more I looked into it, the more upset I got because shenanigans was going on. Yeah. And so, although I didn't want to get involved, I realized at the time that I had to because I had the experience. I had, I, I had some knowledge about running. I knew a lot about the, about the process of being a community board member, and I said, listen, I will help you. I will get involved. And that's how it happened. Oh, so this is the political dimension. 
So that's the environmental part. So that's obviously that's r running and the environment. What about the shirt that you're wearing, Will? The, 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 is, is, this is another issue, isn't it? Another cause. 500. Well, you're running well, the and, official hosting. And, and I was going hosting. to ask about, about this one. Yes. Run anyway. Yes, which is the host charity organization for this show. Is that's that right? right. That's so right. tell us about those two. Those two are very much connected. Mm. When the New York City Marathon was canceled, I think in 2012, it was canceled at the last minute, like a, like a late Friday afternoon. And these two young fellows in, in New Jersey, not New Yorkers, Lance was training to run for the New York City Marathon to honor his uncle who had passed away from brain cancer. And he said, well, I need to run this because I want to honor the, the, the miles that I put in, the charity miles that I want to put in. So I'm sure other people want to do it, so I'm going to run it anyway. So that night before he went to bed, he created a Facebook event inviting everybody to care to meet up at the Tavern Under Green uh -huh. and they were going to run anyway. Yes. When he got up the next day, he had 50 people. It took off. It was a great success. I, I followed it online and I invited them to come to the show. I was so impressed with them. And at that time, they were ready to establish the Run Anyway Foundation. So I said, I want to support you. I think this is a great cause. The purpose of their foundation is to run for other charities and to raise funds to help those that cannot run for themselves. I see. So they're kind of umbrella over running charities or something like that, or, yes. or they support other, other charities which, right. which are using running. They support running. help people not commit suicide, they hunger things, you know, help people that are starving, people that are experiencing homelessness, mm. lots of little charities that they support. Now, their biggest charity that they support is 500 for the Fallen. It's a relay, and it's a relay that starts in Concord, Massachusetts, a few days before Memorial Day, the Thursday before Memorial Day, and it goes all the way, multi-day run, goes all the way to the National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia, almost 500 miles. And it's to support the Children of Fallen Patriots, which is a charity that donates 100 percent, a rarity in charity, 100 percent of everything they collect to scholarships to kids that have lost a parent in any war. That brings us back really to, to the beginning of our conversation and the importance of the education that you got and, and, and how that helped yes. you to have, to have the life you have. And then you added to that. I want to ask one more personal question. The quality that you bring, bring to this show and that seems to me to make it so successful is your generous interest in your guests. You genuinely you listen to them. You don't interrupt them. You, <laughs> you let them talk. You seem, and maybe it's running that has done this for you, you seem very positive. You seem to take a very positive view about doing things, being creative, being constructive. Is, is, that, is that your nature? Is, is, are you a positive person? And has running given this to you, do you think? It's only when I got to City College when I got to see, meet other people from all over the place. And I got to meet women because in, I was an all boys high school mm. and I was terribly frightened of women. I considered them, and they still are, as a superior species. And so in college, when I got to sit next to them, I became much happier. And so a friend of mine would, told me about this poem. Um, I think his name was Robert Hall or something like that. And he, and, and he quoted a line, uh, live in a steady joy. Oh, and Donald, that, Donald Hall. Donald yes, Hall. Yes, yes, he yes. was the American Poet Laureate about yes. 2000, something like that. Yes, no, yes, a bit, yes. bit before that. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, a friend of mine yes. told me about that poem, the line anyway, and that line resonated with me. He said, you know, I think I live in a steady joy and it started in college and it never left me. And running, of course, I, I, I love the camaraderie of running. I'm not into the numbers. I can't tell you what year I did my PR. Many runners do. They know exactly all their runs, not only you know, the most mm -hmm. recent ones, but all of them. I am not numbers oriented, even though I'm a mathematician. I just love the experience of running. The best moment for me is getting to, to meeting the runners at the, at the event. Even though I may not see them because I'm in the back of the line or in the middle, I see them later, I'll see them for brunch, and I love eating with them. But so, so it is the joy of running that, that, 
brings, that keeps me into the steady state of joy. Well, that's great. And then to that, you've added this whole dimension of good causes and serving the community and using running. It's a, it, it all, I think, is that all expresses why this show is important and why, it's, why it strikes people and, 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 um, and, and, and keeps, keeps that degree of significance. The importance of this, too, this is Manhattan Neighborhood Network. It's a learning laboratory. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a hidden gold mine because it's, it's free. It's open to any resident of Manhattan. There are other studios in the other boroughs, so it's not unique to Manhattan. It's not unique to New York. There are other, other studios throughout the world, throughout the country, certainly, and perhaps the world, that offers its citizens, its residents, a way to speak back to the community. And so this... This, had, this show happened overnight, as I said. You know, I just woke up, and then four months later, I had Gloria and Susan with me, have been with me for 150 shows, and they keep it positive, they keep it light, and it's been a lot of fun, and I'm constantly learning. This is like a learning institute, and I learn different things from the other producers. One of the things that I bring out uh, from the runners, many of the runners are singers, they play instruments, and, I, and I, I encourage them to come and sing and, pl and play an instrument. That's so why I have, I have many runners do wonderful shows. In fact, one of my uh, viewers said I can do uh, an all-star all -star band of just the <laughs> musical talent that I brought into the show. Well, I'm not going to sing, but, but, but I'm going to wrap up this particular conversation. The 150th conversation of, of Got to Run with Will. I'm Roger Robinson. I've been talking today with runner, philanthropist, mathematical genius, uh, <laughs> t community TV producer, uh, and the creator of this show, which has made its own special contribution to New York running and running more widely than that. Uh, Will, we thank you for your many contributions that you've made that decision at that point in your life to put back into society, as you've now continued very generously to do, including to the running community, including to the show. Will Sanchez, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. A pleasure.